Hello again, everyone. You're joining us for another episode of Executive Platform's Blueprint podcast series. My name is Jeff Mix. I'm head of content and research. My guest today is Teresa Goreski of Compliance Architects. Um, we're going to be having a conversation about some of the issues and trends pharmaceutical manufacturers are facing today. And I'll say at the start, I'm really looking forward to this because I had this conversation on a similar theme with Teresa last year, and I've been using it as my example for the last <laughs> year. For all the other podcast episodes you've enjoyed, she's sort of been, and this is how good it can be. So having set expectations sky high, <laughs> Teresa, thank you so much for joining me again. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Why don't we start off by actually talking about some of the issues and trends that your organization is, is helping their clients with. Uh, and for the context of our listeners who may not have seen last year's episode, Compliance Architects is sort of a one-stop shop for what is going on in the industry, how they should be moving forward in a, a tightly regulated space, but also, you know, real industry knowledge and in-depth knowledge of like, you know, this is really what's working on the ground or have you tried this? And uh, I'm, I'm really excited to see what you would even bring to this conversation in terms of top of mind, because I'm going to learn something. <laughs> so, you know, we are working this last year across the board. We're working with device companies that are under warning letter and, are ha and have significant gaps against the required standards and drug companies that are in similar situations. But we're doing some exciting work in cell and gene therapy, mm. exciting work in regenerative medicine and transformational medicine. And this is a very interesting space because the manufacturing processes are very small scale. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a, ba a batch is a lot of one. I take your cells, I genetically engineer them, I give them back to you, I treat your cancer. So we're spanning the globe. We now have clients in all four corners of the globe and we're doing a lot of work with companies that are thinking about personalized vaccines for cancer. We're doing work, as I said, in cell and gene therapy, tissue therapy. We actually helped one company get through the approval process for tissue therapy this last year to implant tissue into an infant that doesn't have an immune system. At a macro level, I see lots of discussion about regulators still thinking they're gonna harmonize regulations. I will tell you that the FDA will have lots of collaborative conversations, but I don't anticipate anything's going to truly be harmonized. I don't think the rules and the regs that we live with in the Code of Federal Regulations will go away. What I do think is that we're gonna see more and more harmonization I do think we're going to see more and more unusual ways to manufacture. I do think that we're going to see more and more of parts of the FDA want to enable new technologies. So we were at a gene and cell therapy conference not very long ago, and you know the leader of the gene and cell therapy area within inside FDA is really willing to talk to industry about how to enable them to get to market with these unique therapies. We've not seen this in this industry since I started working long ago. So we're seeing regulators collaborate. We're seeing all of these new technologies that are not manufactured in any of the ways they have been before. None of the quality requirements and the quality systems are the same. The box that we lived in is no longer the box that we live in today. And the future, I think, of the pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical industry has to do more with how to treat unique disease states. And we will see the large volume drugs that treat cholesterol and blood pressure and all of those sorts of things be done at CDMOs offshore, maybe inside the US. But they will look for how they can gain efficiency there so that they can invest in these very specialized technologies that will change the world. I mean, it sounds so exciting. And I remember last year we were talking about sort of the regulators and, and what they might be doing. And, and here, again, it's sort of the top of mind issue. I remember having a conversation years ago with someone who said, you know, if we started over from a blank sheet of paper, the regulatory regime wouldn't look anything like what it is now because we've added a piece and we've added a piece. Yeah. Is there a, a, a potential with this new suite of treatments that are coming online? Maybe there is an opportunity to actually start fresh and put in regulations on a case-by-case -case basis that matter. You know, it's interesting because it's hard to pass a set of regulations. What it's not as hard to do is to draft good guidance and provide information to industry. So what we're starting to see is the Small Business Administration within FDA. We're starting to see other parts of FDA produce webinars where reviewers from CBER are actually engaging with participants in the webinar, presenting case studies and answering their questions. 
That didn't happen five and 10 years ago. When the biotech industry was first born, for example, you met with the regulators privately, you dealt with your issues privately, there was no such media or platform to be able to do that. Today, you can go to a webinar and hear 10 other companies that are dealing with the same issues you are, ask questions openly in a webinar with FDA, and actually get advice and answers. And I wonder if some of that is because it is so new, we're all figuring out the right answer it together is. instead of there being a barrier between, hey, you're acting in the wrong way and you need to comply with this standard. It is. And I think the other thing that the regulators are understanding is these new therapies are treating diseases you couldn't treat, right? There are clinical studies going on right now in uh, Angelman syndrome. A child is developmentally challenged will never develop past three to six years of age. And there's a gene therapy that is moving further and further into clinical development that may change the life of a child with that genetically oriented disorder. Mm. It's, it's a very interesting time. And I think what the regulators see is that in this space of gene and cell therapy, we have a client that we're just starting to work with and they have six different gene therapies. They're looking at type two diabetes. They're looking at Parkinson's disease. They're looking at Alzheimer's, and I don't remember off the top of my head the two other disease states, but it's absolutely staggering. When you think about the fact that you are going to treat somebody for Parkinson's disease genetically and that the disease will be gone mm. and managed, you have no way with classical pharmaceuticals today to do that. No. You can slow the disease down. You can try to treat the symptoms. You can introduce physical therapy, but you can't make it go away. These guys may make it go away. And again, it's it's so exciting. And to think that the breakthrough really is looking at each individual patient, how has this happened to you yep. and how can we fix it? Which of course involves an entirely different path to treatment. Yeah, the idea of personalized um, vaccines for cancers. We take a sample of your tissue, the, the cancer tumor. We um, understand its total genetic makeup. We develop a vaccine to teach your immune system to look for those cells. We operate, we do radiation, we might do immuno or chemo to shrink the tumors, change the size of the mass. But when we're done with all of that, to make sure that there are no resident cells and that this won't come back and metastasize, we give you a vaccine. And that vaccine tells your immune system, look for that guy that caused you trouble last time and don't let it come back. Incredible. It's and, amazing. And. and Again, I come to the idea of like, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we would build a factory for medicine. We would. And today, it's going to be every, I don't know, hospital or every state is going to have a machine that takes a human sample and outputs a single treatment for that one patient. This it's is an amazing idea. Exactly. There's a, a firm here that we've talked to a little bit called Smart Labs. And they have, if you think about how when you move, you, you rent a pod, you put everything in it, they have modular sterile manufacturing. Mm -hmm. It can be sized, it can be scoped, it can be set up so that you could do very small batches, one-of-a-kind batches. You could do larger volumes, you could do it in your own facility, you can go to their facilities. So if you're a venture capital startup company and you want to make a novel gene therapy, you can partner with someone like that and you can take your product there and never have to contemplate bricks and mortar. Amazing. And, and what does that do for your... Uh your costs of scale of, of actually well, building the facility. Your cost of scale is dramatically different because you're not building bricks and mortar, mm -hmm. right? You're building a modular unit. And by the way, you don't use that modular unit full time. Mm -hmm. You use that modular unit once a month, once a week, but you don't now need 10 other products that you put into your facility that you have to operate at a large, you know, at a large, a large percentage of time to make your money. Incredible. It's absolutely incredible to me. And I still think that at some point for therapy, cell therapy like CART-T, we're going to be doing this like in a box mm -hmm. at a hospital. We're going to take your cells. It may not be bedside, but we're going to take your cells. We're going to go do the work we need to do to program them. And we're going to give them back to you and you'll get them in an infusion center. I, I had another conversation where someone said it's going to be like a Coke machine, yep. right? You're going to put the sample into the top and the, the medicine's going to come out the bottom. And, and that person said, so really the next 10 years of my life is figuring out who's going to build that Coke machine, who's going to maintain that Coke machine, who's going to monitor that Coke machine to make sure it's in compliance. Because now instead of one facility in North America and one facility in Asia and one facility in Europe, there's going to be tens of thousands of these things. And that Coke machine may not just dispense Coke. It may dispense Sprite. 
and mm-hmm. May Dispense, Dr. Pepper, and five other brands. And it has to be appropriately cleaned so that the Dr. Pepper isn't in the 7-Up. Right. Or the Sprite. Right? And so I think we're going to see incredible innovation in manufacturing technology. I think we're going to see AI enablement. But I'll tell you, I think what's more important is some of the conversations we've had here this week that talk about how we use data and move to a place where all of the data that's generated during production and during all the quality processes and laboratory processes comes together so that you really don't release a batch anymore. It's If there's an exception, you would deal with that. I, I want to expand upon AI. I mean, I want to expand upon everything, but I feel like in the last year, year and a half, whenever anyone mentions AI, their eyes light up. And I think this is such an exciting time already for the oh. future of medicine, but AI is going to be such a huge help because as you say, there's a tidal wave of data coming in. No one has time to look at it no. all. Is there a way to leverage these new tools to make things even faster? So it's interesting because we have a client right now that needs a, a much better change control system, right? They need to document the change, assess all of the impacts, understand what needs to be done to validate that change, and then make a decision about whether FDA needs to be notified ahead of time concurrently or maybe in an annual update, maybe not at all. And I looked at a form that is a manual form. So it's a word template, right, that is that you fill out. It's connected to your doc management system, so it knows what all your change control procedures and all your ancillary procedures say about how to do a change. It's also connected to the regs and whatever else you connected to. And you start up your company and you say, okay, I want to make a change. It goes and looks at all of that and it tells you what you probably need to consider doing. As you make more and more changes and you build your history and your information and it learns your product, when you go into that forum and say, I want to buy a new autoclave, it says, oh, you requalified an autoclave or built one a while back. FDA just did a new presentation on that, which you uploaded. Here's everything you need to do. Wow. It was a simple word form. And I looked at the gentleman who was showing it to me, and I said, holy cow. This is staggering because it learns over time what you need to do to run a root cause investigation for deviation, what kind of corrective actions you might consider putting in place, for a given sort of situation. And I thought, wow, even without an automated tool, if you were a small firm and you were starting manually, this would be an absolute miracle for a company starting with a manual word form, if it could be a smart form Mm. and connected to everything. It minimizes the number of people you need. It increases the accuracy because you're basing it on what's in your procedures, what's in FDA guidance, what other information you've connected it to. So you've increased the opportunity to be accurate and spot on significantly by just connecting it to all those sources of information. I I love this, and I do want to talk a little bit about those small organizations and maybe even the idea of like there's a need to minimize headcount because there are so many good ideas right now. There's not enough you know, trained technical operations people to go around, perhaps AI is going to be one of the bridges to allow one CTO to do a lot of work all at once. It is, but I'll tell you, we we had a conversation today about proactive quality with a gentleman from AstraZeneca in room two. And I have to say, I wrote down 80 ideas from that conversation. You could apply those ideas at a small level or a large level, but they have taken down to the shop floor. Typically, when a new operator starts, And they need six months of technical training. If you're going to work in a sterile filling room, you might need six months of training and education, of reading procedures and going to workshops and maybe working in a little modular lab, six months before you actually contribute to the company's bottom line. Six months. Mm -hmm. They have taken away all of that training, that style of training, which is the old-fashioned methodology, and they've gone to a virtual experience so that you start working within about six weeks and everything that you've trained on is in a virtual environment. So now an operator starts to go, starts, knows he's gonna be working or she's gonna be working in a sterile suite and it takes six weeks to be up and running and the accuracy and the enablement because he, he was talking about an example of hand washing. He said, I took the training and it, it wa- the cameras watch you. And he said, you know, when you wash your hands before you gown up, you must wash your hands for 30 seconds. 
and you have to wash the tops, the bottoms, every little nook and cranny of your hands before you gown up and glove up. He said, I failed five times. Wow. You can't do a human effectiveness check. If I watched you do that five times, I would miss what those cameras picked up. Mm -hmm. I was fascinated. And as you say, in a, a virtual environment, they can be hands-on in real time. In a very, very short, short period, of, period time. of time. And everything except the output is real, right? Yep. Because they are doing all the processes and the data being collected is right. And so they could say, hey, if this batch had gone out, it wouldn't have been effective. Right. What are we going to learn from that? Instead of waiting six months before you put someone in dealing with a real product. Exactly. It was fascinating. So I really think that we're at a place where at the shop floor level, there are technologies now that are going to be enablers. I think it's going to allow you to bring new people on board. I think it's going to decrease the number of issues they have performing their jobs well because they will have learned techniques from videos and virtual experiences that will teach them how to wash their hands, which will control the opportunity for any microbial counts because of oopses during during production. Mm -hmm. it, I, I think actually that we're going to move to a place where even in the laboratory and at the shop floor level, we will be able to enable people to be much more successful and from a safety, a quality, and an operational efficiency perspective, it'll be a very different kind of environment and there'll be tremendous savings. But as this guy said, you track those savings at very small incremental levels, right? Every one of those little changes that you make across your workforce makes a difference and when you add all of that up, it begins to make a very big difference. And it becomes one of those things that it funds the next set of tools that it they does. want to try. So it, it, does. it actually is a self-reinforcing and self-perpetuating cycle. It does. I also want to talk about the smaller companies that because they are in a position, they're starting. They can start with this stuff instead of having to upgrade their, their processes to include it. The challenge that they have is they have a hard time getting the capital. Mm -hmm. You know, they go to market. And, or they go to, the, when they become publicly held, but even before then, they go to venture capital and they're asking for money. And that money is for this drug or this biological, this cell therapy, it's for this, this thing. And they're going to that, those people with the money and they're saying, look, I need money. And what those companies are usually willing to fund is the amount of money it takes to truly just develop the product and to get it into clinical evaluation. And it doesn't pay for all these things that will allow you to scale up right. and get to market in a very efficient way. And we've had a lot of discussions about that already today here at the conference. And it's been really fascinating because I think someone's got to get very smart about making a business case. You have to begin with the end in mind. And the time to do that is when you finish phase two clinical studies and you're pretty sure you've got efficacy and safety, that's the point where you need to think about the end. And you need to find the money to be able to begin to make some of those investments in enabling technology. And or you've got to find the contract manufacturers and the contract labs. If you're a small, very small virtual company, you've got to find the folks that have justified those enabling technologies because you'll have a much smoother startup, mm -hmm. much smoother pass through the FDA approval process, and you will have a much more sustainable and reliable supply of product. And it's coming to market faster and helping people sooner. Correct. And uh, I mean, when we're talking about the next generation of medicine, wouldn't it be great if it's five and 10 years out and not 10 and 20 years out? Yeah. And I'll tell you, FDA's tolerance and the public's tolerance, politicians' tolerance for a drug shortage when it's a life-saving drug is less than zero, mm -hmm. right? So if you can't treat a child or you can't treat an adult in a timely manner and you could save their life or change their life... That's not a place you want to be No, as a manufacturer. And you don't want the, that to be your brand. When you start listing these challenges, I immediately start thinking no small organization can have all of this know-how in their startup team. They don't. And I wonder if this is where compliance architects can enter the conversation as a resource to the industry. It's absolutely a place to partner with a good consulting firm. Um, in fact, we have people with deep knowledge and technical expertise. One of the newest consultants we've added that I think you met last November actually got some of the first CAR-T and gene therapy products to market with a very large Fortune 50 drug manufacturer mm -hmm. over the last few years. Um, all of us have extensive deep experience getting things to market, getting things through the approval process. A venture startup firm like that usually has a very entrepreneurial MD, clinical development, 
strategic marketing business person at the helm at the CEO level. They invest in their own resources, usually at the VP, CM&C level. So somebody who's going to help manufacture and set up a supply chain for them. They usually have regulatory consultants. They will often hire quality consultants initially. They will have their own clinical development folks, right? Their own medical folks. Sometimes they have some of their own R&D folks. Sometimes they outsource some of that. They work extensively with third-party providers. So CDMOs, they work with outside labs, they work with CROs to execute their clinical studies because they don't have the infrastructure of a large company. We work from good laboratory practice studies, which is preclinical development, through clinical development, all the way through to the marketplace where they'll be impacted and need to comply with good manufacturing practices at wherever they're gonna be manufacturing. So I find it's fun to work with those startup companies because when you have deep industry experience, you can start applying all the things you learned the hard way. All the things that if you could have started from scratch, you would have done that are innovative, smart, they're right-sized, they're risk-based, um, you've got the right priorities in mind, and we're very good at architecting solutions as they go through clinical development. So they have the quality processes and strategy in place that matches the level of clinical development they're in, right? You don't need to have the infrastructure that a big company would have to support a phase one study. You need a very scaled back kind of structure, and we focus on those things that are the most important and leave the other things for later stages of development when you finally have more data on the safety and efficacy of your product. So we're working with a number of gene and cell therapy companies. And one of the gene therapy companies that we're working with is going into market with this Parkinson's disease product. There's a very elaborate device system that needs to be used that creates a portal into the brain to apply the drug through. And it's fascinating because why would a company developing gene therapy have a medical device expert? They would never have that. They tried to start on their own and it was a debacle. Every single thing about the device that they tried to do on their own was a disaster. So I happened to meet somebody from that company um, at the VP level, and she said, do you know anything about devices? I said, we've got great people with devices and combination products. We have had somebody there for two and a half years shepherding the quality program for the entire device program. And until they actually get to phase three, that will be the point. They will probably help put in place their own device quality group in a small way, but until they get to that point, we have the same person that she absolutely loves and that has worked intimately with that organization that is part of that organization. He helped them find new suppliers, he helped them qualify new suppliers, worked with the development team to get an acceptable device assembly set up to be able to, to deliver the gene therapy, and they're moving into phase two studies now. And that's an incredible story, and I have to think every person who comes to you comes with their own unique questions. So I guess the next thing I want to ask is, what does getting started look like? If I'm a pharmaceutical manufacturer who's been listening to this interview and saying, oh, you know, we've got this pain point, or we've got this opportunity we're not sure how to realize, or we've got this challenge in front of us, how do you get that ball rolling? How do you start a conversation? You can go to www.compliancearchitects.com, mm -hmm. and you can send a note in to us and ask us to connect with you and we'll reach out to you and understand better what your needs are. You can also reach out to any one of us. We're all on LinkedIn. I get lots of requests for information, help, um, just general inquiries. Sometimes people looking for free advice um, through LinkedIn, and I'm always happy to set up time to uh, chat with someone and learn more about what they need. We run into people at conferences, but I find LinkedIn to be a very useful tool for us and or our general website. We've got a website. You can reach out to us through that website. That website has a number of case studies on it. You can read about each one of our principal VP level consultants, the kind of expertise we have, the kinds of projects that we've run. Um, so I would invite anyone to visit that website and to reach out to us. And I encourage everyone listening to this, you know, first of all, the website is a great resource, but also people like Teresa, who are so generous as to say, reach out through LinkedIn. I mean, you can clearly see how much I enjoy speaking with her. So I encourage everyone to reach out if they've got something that they want to say or something that they want to ask. Just before I let you go, Teresa, I wonder, you know, if there was one or two things that you wanted to just say to people and have them think about it further. Is there something within the industry that they should be highlighting or chewing on or learning about right now uh, that should be top of mind? 
Recognize that if you're working with a brand new technology in a very unique rare disease state, the regulators are going to enable you. But they are still going to require certain things. So just because clinically they're enabling you to get to market, don't assume from a chemistry manufacturing controls perspective, you're going to get a free pass. On the other hand, the way the rules used to be applied aren't going to fit for you. I cannot encourage you enough to meet with FDA, to work with good consultants, to work with the policymakers within FDA and get opinions from them, and interact with FDA when you can in forums like this or other forums because you are actually developing the next FDA guidance document for the next segment of the industry. Don't lose that opportunity because if you don't partner with the regulators, you will struggle, it will take you longer, it will cost you more money, and it's painful. And worse yet, people who really need these products won't get them as soon as they could. I mean, I, I could talk to you all day, but I think that's such a fantastic place to uh, you know stop for now and, and let people chew on that because I think it's a great takeaway. Teresa, thank you again so much for your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs> You've been listening to another episode of Executive Platform's Blueprint Podcast Series. I've been Jeff Mix. Let's do it again soon.